I'm Amber Tresco, and this is about IBD. It's my mission to educate people living with Crohn's disease or ulcerative colitis about their disease and to bring awareness to the patient journey. This is part one of a story about Ryan Stevens, who competed in the Ironman Triathlon in Madison, Wisconsin in September 2019. This is extraordinary because Ryan was diagnosed with Crohn's disease 10 years ago. He swam competitively through high school and college and began participating in triathlons just before his diagnosis. The Crohn's was bad enough that after a few years, he had surgery to remove his colon. At that time, the end of his small intestine was attached to a titanium ring, which was then attached to his anus, and this allowed him to go to the bathroom normally. That lasted a few years, and Ryan was able to get back to swimming, including two swims across Lake Erie. However, the next flare-up of Crohn's caused abscesses to form, which required several more surgeries in an attempt to heal them. Finally, he and his medical team decided on permanent ostomy surgery, and he now lives with a stoma. He worked his way back to triathlon shape, and this time decided to try for the title of Ironman. Ryan, thanks for coming on my show for the second time. Do you remember the first time? Yes, of course. And uh, thank you for having me. Yeah. It was episode four it was more than two years ago, I think. Yeah, it was a while ago. So I asked you to come on the show this time because you recently did a thing before your Crohn's diagnosis and after your sport was swimming. When did you start getting into cycling and running? That was the summer of 2008, about six months, be six to nine months before I got diagnosed. I had a friend who was doing a local triathlon and he needed a lot of help for swimming and he asked me to help him. And so I did a little bit and then he convinced me to sign up for the race. As a former athlete, I have a real mean competitive streak in me. So the first time I ever did one, I was completely hooked because I just reawoken that competitiveness. So you got back into shape along with your friend and you did this local triathlon. Correct. But then you were diagnosed soon after that. Did you do any more? You know, I was gung ho about it. I did about three that summer. I ended up getting for Christmas. I got this really cool tri bike and then March I'm diagnosed and it was just two years of complete hell and it kept deteriorating and, and would fading away basically down to 120 pounds. So th then those next two years, I did nothing. In fact, I sold the bike soon after because I couldn't justify it sitting around gathering dust when I knew I wasn't going to be riding it anytime soon. So. Oh my gosh. That's really upsetting that you sold your bike. Yeah. <sighs> All right. So a few weeks ago, you did a little triathlon called the Iron Man. <laughs> yep. Why did you decide to do an Iron Man right now? I didn't decide. I blame it on my friend Chris because <laughs> he's like, you know, we're both kind of healthy right now. We should just do it. You know, let's do it. So he, he really convinced me. He had done previously, he's done a half iron. I've never done anything more than Olympic distance triathlon. So for me, it takes about two and a half hours to do an Olympic, but you know, the Iron Man's a whole different beast. If it weren't for him, I wouldn't have even tried because he's an incredible athlete. He can bike and run all day long. He's a very decent swimmer as well. He's been working at that. And so I knew we would train together. And in fact, we actually had a whole group of guys, local guys that we would do a lot of stuff together. It was just an adventure. I mean, I, I dragged Chris along on my adventure of trying to swim across Lake Erie. So he's always been there for me. And so he really wanted to do it. I'm like, all right, let's sign up, you know? And I waited. I'm like, dude, I'm not going to sign up until you do, you know? And so then he finally said like, Hey, I signed up. I'm like, all right, I guess it's real. And then I signed up. I have the numbers in front of me because I wouldn't remember them to say them off the top of my head, but the swim is 2.4 miles. Correct. The bike is 112 miles and the run is 26.22 miles, which is 
also marathon. considered to be a marathon. Correct. Right. And you do this in one day. <laughs> one after the other, yes. <laughs> one after the other with eight or ten minutes sometimes in between, <laughs> and that's about it. Right. <laughs> okay. So explain to me how you train for this. I knew that my strong suit was, of course, swimming. And my weakest is running and biking. I'm I'm not very good at either, to be honest. But I did a lot of more biking than running. The one guy we trained with, he he does a spin class for the local Y. And so I took his class quite a bit to try to get stronger. And then once it warmed up enough, we were outside doing longer bike rides. We would do on Saturday about 80 miles. Uh, those guys would do more, but I, I would get around 80, a little bit of running, but, um, usually I overtrain the swimming cause it's just familiar to me and I know how to do that well and, uh, how to do harder workouts. I don't really understand, you know, biking, you get on and you just bike, but I guess there are other ways to, to do that, to get stronger. But, um, I don't really know those. Yeah. It was just a lot of hours a week. Did you track how many hours that you did a week at all? Yeah. Cause my, my awesome watch that a bunch of my IBD family had purchased for me back in 2015 because I was going to quit. I told Brian Greenberg, I was like, I, I think I'm done with triathlon because of how sick that I was that year. And then on my birthday, you know, Samantha presents me with this really cool uh, Garmin watch that you guys had all purchased for me. I mean, this is an expensive watch. And so this watch keeps track of everything you do, every swim, every bike, every run. And if I wanted to go in there, I could look up the statistics of what I did for this entire year. So yeah, I could, I kept track of almost all of it. So there's like plans, right? Like people, some people train according to like a plan. Did you guys have a plan or did you just sort of work it in, in between, you know, I mean, you obviously have jobs and families and other things to do. So Chris had a plan from those few years ago when he did his half iron. He had a a half iron plan. And the other guys in our group, local guys, they had all done Ironman Wisconsin before. So they were pros basically at it. So we got a lot of information from them. I was able to go to Wisconsin to see you do this Ironman. (laughs) It was wild. I've never been to anything like that before. And it just so happens that not only do I know, we both know Brian Greenberg, Spoonie Ironman, because he did an Ironman. But I also know some people locally who have done Ironmans and half Ironmans in the past. And so I was going around and getting all the information that I could about what it was like to go to one of these races and how they got put on and uh, the logistics of it all. But even all of that didn't prepare me for this race. And there were, I don't know, was it almost 2,000 competitors? I don't remember. I think there were 2,400 who were who had registered. And I don't think they all made it to the start line for various reasons. But it might have been like 1,800 that made it to the start line. I'm not sure. Right. So 1,800 people doing swim, bike, run one day in Madison, Wisconsin. And then you've got all the people that come with them. You've got all the volunteers. And it was kind of, I don't remember who I was talking with about the volunteers and that they were saying, there's so many volunteers. Well, I understood by the end of the race why so many volunteers are needed. But anyway, let's start at the beginning of the race. There were 3,000 volunteers. Right. And each and every one of them is totally and absolutely needed. You got there two days before the race, right? It's mandatory. You have to be there by Friday. Oh, okay. You have to be there. Okay. Because you're not there by Friday at five, you can't race. Because you have to turn over your bike and everything else that they require. All this equipment that you have, you have to turn into them on Saturday and you don't really see it again until Sunday morning before the start. Because when you think about it, it's like, okay, you're getting in the water and then you're coming out of the water. Obviously you're not going to bike in whatever you're wearing to swim in. And then you're not necessarily going to run in whatever you're wearing to bike in. So, you know, you have to have all that turned in and it's a huge amount of logistics. And so I got there on Saturday and then it was just like a giant party. Racers tend to be a little nervous the night before or the day before. How did you feel? I was super nervous. As we kind of discussed a little bit with uh, my other friend, Wayne, he had completed Ironman last year 
and he had come along with me as well. As we were talking the night before, Wayne was talking about that shirt that has everybody's name on it that, you know, is competing. I'd kind of said that, well, yeah, it's a cool shirt, but there was no way I was going to buy one before the race because there's no guarantee that I'm going to finish this race. And I mean, the, the longest I'd ever run, honestly, I, I, I ran 10 miles several times, but I've never, I've never run a half marathon in my life and I've never run a marathon let alone after you bike 112 miles. So I was super nervous and I was, you know, like, what did I get into here? There's, I, I hate running. I'm not gonna, you know, so you have all these thoughts that go through your head, but yeah, so I was definitely nervous the night before. I was asking you about the swim because obviously that's your sport and that's where you expected to do the best, but there, this is not just recreational. Like there's people who compete in Iron Ironmans, and they're not professional athletes or anything like that. But then there's also the people that are professionals. And I was asking you and Wayne, like, what does that what does that mean? Like, that's so interesting to me that you would be like a professional triathlete. You know, they also have prize money. So each race that they go to, I believe there is a prize purse that they can be in the running for. Oh, right. There's that. And then there's also you can go to like a, a championship well, Kona is the holy grail, I guess, for, for Ironman, um, which is ha- happens in Hawaii, obviously. So they're trying to win a spot to Kona. If you made it to Kona and you do well, your those sponsorships will come in. I believe that's where, in the research that I did to write the story that I put up at about IBD, I believe that's where the Ironman started, was in Hawaii. Correct. All I know about Kona is that's where the best coffee comes from. That's pretty much <laughs> what I know. But I asked you about the swim and I was asking you how long it was going to take you and you thought it was going to take you about an hour. My goal was to break 55 minutes. I have the Ironman app in front of me. So just so you know. (laughs) And we can talk about stats too because I kind of have something to say about that. But you were out of the water in 58 minutes and 57 seconds and you were second in your age group. And you were 21st by gender. I think people need to understand how, what that actually means. Because, so out of the 1,800 people that competed, and I don't know by gender, you know, how many were men versus how many were women, but out of the men, you were 21st out of all of the men, and you were second in your age group. It's pretty freaking impressive. (laughs) Well, thank you. I know. I don't think it was what you wanted to do. No, it was really, I mean, I was disappointed for a couple of reasons, but the swim was just brutal. And I'm not sure of the number of how many people they actually had to take out of the water who couldn't make it beyond the swim. But there were a high number this year for this event because the, the water was just extremely wavy there was constantly, you know, a wave that you were swimming through or once you turned east onto the course, the waves then were basically in your face. And then when you turned again, they were definitely in your face on the way back. So it was really rough conditions. And, you know, I was close to to what I wanted to go and I'm happy with it. I just wish, wish it was a little faster. Like the night before when we were looking at the course and it was just complete glass and like, I mean, you probably could have walked on that water. It was just amazing. And then the next, you know, a couple hours later, and it was just a tempest, basically. So, yeah. And I have pictures of the night before when 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 we went to look because you were nice enough to sort of take me to the venue and show me around a little bit so that I would know where to go um, at like six thirty, seven o'clock in the morning. Okay. And it was it when I look at the picture now, and then I look at the picture that I took after you were in the water, it was a huge, like 180 degree difference. I can see as to how it would be really a struggle. And I don't know how many people were pulled out of the water, but I do know when I was looking at the stats in the Ironman app, uh, which showed you things like how many, how many people didn't complete or didn't start. And there was an awful lot of didn't complete. To not complete, it must be really upsetting. And that was something that I was focused on a lot was the completion of it 
not so much the times. I only bring up the times for the swimming because it's impressive and not it's impressive for anybody, let alone somebody who's been through what you've been through and come back from, you know, two very long devastating flares and battles with Crohn's disease and then also living with a permanent ostomy. Most people it takes what, like two hours? They have two hours and 20 minutes. That's the cutoff time. Oh, to complete it. Yeah, you have okay. two hours and right. 20 minutes once you enter the water. I'd say maybe the average is like an hour and a half for, for most. Right. Oh, okay. But still, like you were out of the water like right after the pros were. So that was really, that was fun. That I, part was fun for me. I, I beat a few pros actually. So that was one of my goals. Did you really? Yeah. <laughs> if you look on. Oh, that's awesome. If you look on the I'm going to have to look it up. Yeah, you look on the Iron Man app and you just look up the pros and what their swim times were. I did beat a few of them. So I'm going to look that up now. Well, just real quick, the other thing about the swim is when I got out of the water, you know, I glanced at my watch and for whatever reason, and I have no idea why, but it said 45 minutes, right? So I'm thinking it was possible with that current, like when you were going out, you were really getting pushed along, you know? And I'm like, wow, yeah. everyone's time is going to be amazing because if I did 45, well, anyway, Come to find out, I was a 58, you know, but anyway, that was disappointing. And then you have to go and get on the bike. Okay. So we go, I'm with Megan Starshack. She lives close by. And Megan and I leave and we go to the bike route and we're waiting for you. And let me tell you, you completing the swim that quickly was such a great thing for us. Like it was very helpful for us. So thank you for that because we were able to get in the car and go to the bike route and get a parking spot and all of that because we were ahead of everybody else that was doing that. So that was really funny. So we went to the bike route and we went to an area where a cycle shop that she works with, that Megan works with had set up and they had food and they had music and all of this. And it was on this great big hill. So basically, we just set up shop and we're waiting for you to come by. And we were looking at the app to figure out when you were going to come by. We were actually there early enough that we saw some of the pros come by, like the, like the first couple of pros. And they had all of this chalk. And Megan says to me, isn't Ryan's favorite superhero Captain America? And I says, yes. So she starts drawing this giant Captain America shield in the road. And then I start writing in the road. And then it occurs to me, though, that even with this big as we thought we made that, that it was probably still not very visible when you were working hard and trying to get through this race on your bike. But anyway, so tell me, because we haven't been able to really connect about this at all, but tell me what that was like to compete on that bike route. It was brutal because I'm not a very decent biker. You know, I didn't know that I was, I was second in my age group at the end of the swim, but I sure did count just about every single person in my age group past me on the bike, you know, cause our ages are on the back of our calves. Right. And I'm like, yeah, that dude's in my age group. Yep. There goes another and another and another. And I'm like, oh my God, I think every single one. And, and almost, it was just about every single guy in my age group passed me on the bike. But anyway, the, it's just hilly. It's a super hilly course and I need flat and no wind. And it was also windy and there was rain toward the end of it. And that hill, so that hill that where you and Megan were, Chris and I had gone back in June, we had gone over to ride the course, which was super smart idea that we did because we got an idea of what we were dealing with. And then back in June, I was like, oh my God, I, what am I getting into here? But we had never, we never did that hill when we did our ride for whatever reason, I do, I do not remember that hill on when we were there in June. So you you guys had mentioned that you were going to be on this hill. So the one hill I I was going up, I was like, this is the hill. Like, where are they? And there's no one here. And then I made that turn and started to go up the the actual hill. And I knew what people were talking about. It, that was brutal. I mean, it was just long and I was in my lowest gear possible and barely moving. And no, I did not see the Captain America shield on the on the ground because I was just in agony. And literally the first time up, because it's a loop, you have to do two loops of the bike course. So the first time up that hill, once I got beyond it, I was like, how in the hell am I going to do that a second time? I literally thought there's just no way. But as you know, I was going up that hill and you guys were running alongside me, which was awesome. As you learn and people told you, it's 
it's incredible when we do see the people that came there to support us. So, you know, when I saw you, Megan, I saw Wayne several times on the chorus, it's just incredible to, to see all of you. And so as I was going up that hill the first time, and I think I said, you know, this still beats surgery. I'm here you doing said that this. the second time. It was the second time. I don't know. I'm delirious. I was delirious by then. But it was the truth though, right? Because I was out there doing it and I still hadn't completed it. You know, that's always in the back of my mind because I'm like, you still got to go run a marathon. So this isn't over until it's over. But the truth was I was out there. I was attempting it and it wasn't surgery. You know, it wasn't 2015 living on my couch, only functioning because of painkillers, basically. So yeah, I've come a long way since then. And to answer the question that's probably going to come at the end, but I'll do it right now. I really don't have a desire to do another one. Uh, <laughs> honest to God, it was a lot of training, a lot of time, and I have to think long and hard about another one. A half would be very doable, I think, but the full Ironman was just a real undertaking. Well, first of all, that hill, from my vantage point where we were sort of in the middle of the hill, you could also see the beginning of the hill where it started because the the road did curve almost like a C. So we would see the riders coming around. That way, of course, you couldn't tell who it was. And that was another fun point is that we didn't know what you were wearing. So we didn't, you, you know, we were basically just doing our best to look out for you. But as soon as you came around the as soon as you came around that curve, I recognized you. I knew it was you. But then as we were like running up next to you, that was actually really funny because I'm slow and I was able to keep up with you at least until the top of the hill. You know, even though I was carrying like I have my camera and, and um, my audio recorder and this and that, you know. But that goes that just showed me how challenging that hill was to bike up because uh, because on the flat parts, right? I mean, you just you're whizzing past. There's just nothing, you know. And by the way, I don't know if I told you, there were people that walked their bike up that hill. Really? I didn't know that. Yeah, there were people that got off their bike towards the middle of that hill and ended up what not a lot, but there were several. I don't think I would be able to do that because I'm going so slow. If I tried to get off my bike, I would have fallen. I would have crashed. <laughs> and if I was going any slower, I probably would have just fell over because I'm going so slow. The The first time you came up the hill, it was just, try I was trying to stay out of the way of the other riders because I didn't want to annoy anybody. I was very worried about that and, and, and all of that. And then I thought, gosh, I don't know if this is annoying to have somebody run next to you and basically shout in your ear, you can do it, keep going. Like, I was like, maybe that's really annoying. I have no idea. But you were like, oh my gosh, thanks you guys for being here. And I was cracking up. I was laughing so hard. <laughs> that, like, you're in the middle of this like ridiculous hill. And seeing people's faces, seeing the, seeing the look on the athletes' faces as they went up the hill, just the concentration and obviously the determination and then as people would cheer and they would smile and things like that. But it was clearly a, a really difficult point. And so, well, then you came up and then it was it was kind of funny because it was like, oh, you know, it was a big thing. OK. And then we sat down for a while and like had a hot dog <laughs> <laughs> and a beer and waited for you to come around again. And then you came around again and then we ran with you again. And that's when you were like, this is better than surgery. What else was in your mantra that you were thinking about as you were on that very long ride? That I'm only doing it because of the ostomy. I would have not been there if not for that. There's just no way I would have ever attempted an Ironman. I wouldn't, I just physically would not have been able to do it. And mm -hmm. I would, I would often look around at, you know, it was a beautiful countryside there with these rolling hills and all these crops are growing. And, you know, I'd look out and say, I'm so glad that I'm here and able to do this and kind of soaked it in. Cause it was, it's the truth. Like 2015, no way. Yeah. A lot of it was, you know, I'm here and I don't know why I chose the Iron Man, Chris, but um, <laughs> it's just uh, an incredible feeling to be out there. I mean, especially on the run, because then you can actually talk to people because let's face it, I was walking. <laughs> when I got to the aid stations, I would walk and I would drink 
thank God they had Coca-Cola. You can start up a little conversation with someone and then you think, oh, I need to keep going. So then you, then you take off. But it's interesting to, to get to know them in that regard. You bring up an interesting point with the run. You make no bones about the fact that running is not your favorite. It's evil. And you don't enjoy it. Yet you're talking about the run as almost being the most social part of this race. Oh, yeah, for sure. You could talk on the bike, but honestly, there's drafting penalties that you can get on the bike. Yes. So you can't hang out with people. And, you know, once you pass someone, you're supposed to get ahead of them. You know, you're going to get a penalty. Like, so on the bike, you're really, and you're, the bike is dangerous. I mean, I'm not sure how many people crashed, but I did hear there were crashes and it rained, like I said, on the, on the second loop. I mean, you're coming down those hills. I was maybe 30, I think I got up to like 30 five miles an hour was my fastest, but these other people were, they had to have been going 45, 50 miles an hour, you know, coming down these hills, you know, you need to be focused on the bike and you're not really out there to be social, I guess, but on the run, there's no drafting rules. You're not traveling along at 20 miles an hour. And if you wrecked, you know, you're going to be spending the rest of your day in the hospital. So yeah, the run is a lot more social. It's interesting that you brought up the bike part being dangerous because they don't close the roads off for this. And so there was traffic going by and there were quite a few times in the area where we were, where I was really concerned, but I, it also made me wonder how often someone's time was impacted because of that. Because not only did you have people just trying to get to, it was a Sunday, just trying to get to wherever they were get to, but then the, you had all the race officials, they were in cars, they were on motorcycles, things like that. So it was a fair amount of traffic and I did worry about the danger. I didn't see any crashes. I didn't either. You know, I couldn't say. But I'm I, glad I didn't see any crashes, but I was very worried about it. Yeah. And there were the uh, Facebook page that I belonged to about Ironman Wisconsin after the race, you know, people were posting about how they, they had wrecked. So I didn't see any, I didn't witness any, but we're basically guests of that community. I mean, there's a, quite a large police presence. I never once had to stop going through a cross section because the police were there to stop the vehicles. So I always felt safe and the loops, you know, the two loops, it's really out in the middle of nowhere. You know, I mean, there were times where I was biking. I'm like, is there anyone around me? Like, <laughs> you know, uh, but anyway, it, I never felt like I was in danger on the bike other than that damn hill that was trying to kill me. Hey, super listener. Special thanks to Ryan Stevens for letting me tag along for his race. The second part of his story is coming up in episode 57, and you won't want to miss it. You can find Ryan on Facebook as IBD Swimming and Me. I will include all his social media information in the show notes, as well as on the episode 56 page on my site, aboutibd.com. I love bringing you this content, and you can support me in return by sharing it with others and by leaving a review of my show in your favorite podcast app. Here's a taste of what's coming up on the next About IBD. And so I sat down at that time because there was a chair there, and that was a mistake because I changed my socks, and then I almost did not stand back up. Thanks for listening. And remember, until next time, I want you to know more about IBD.